phones and they're like, what's wrong, Lord? Oh, nothing. If I have to tell you, it doesn't mean anything, does it? All right? He's not telling them this because his feelings are hurt. He's telling them this because he is concerned about them. And he's concerned about the life that they are missing. I am the bread of life. If you get caught up in the miracle, you're going to need another miracle tomorrow, and another miracle tomorrow, and another miracle tomorrow. But if you will understand that I can satisfy every hunger, and you're just not praying from one need to another, and following from one need to another, that I can satisfy every hunger, then you can begin to understand the true plan that I have for your life. Because here's what I, I think is true for my life. When I make my relationship with God about the miracle that I need or the touch. And look, there's not, I want you to catch this. Nothing wrong for praying what you need. Man, pray for your needs. Pray for all that. But when I don't go past that, what I'm really doing, I'm not following Jesus. I'm following my own plan. And I think he can help me get there faster. And I'm going my own way, say, just Jesus, will you do this? Okay, thank you, will you do this? Will you do this? And I'm really following my own way. Instead of saying, I recognize you are the bread of life. You're the source. You're the one who satisfies. You're the one who gives me strength. And I want to follow your way. And I will trust you on that way. And see, that's what God wants for our life. He wants us to understand that if God could do this in my life, what could he do for the rest of my life? How could he use my life? And Jesus gives them an illustration. And, and, and again, it's in this chapter, so go back and read it. He goes back and points them to their ancestors, to the Israelites. There was a time when God brought the Israelites out of slavery. And they were in the desert. And they had no food to eat. And here's the thing. Here's how God, good God is. They didn't even pray for food. They just complained that there was no food. And God, miraculously, every single day, for 40 years, rained down food from heaven. These people literally got up every morning, saw a miracle from God, and every single one of them died in the desert. Not one of that generation ever made it to the promised land which he was saying, I've got a place for you where you don't have to live daily. And I'm not saying not a reliance from God, but you're not so focused on the needs that you think that you have in your life. I've got a land for you that is flowing with milk and honey. But I can't get you there if you don't stop looking at what you need and look up and understand who I am and have a dependence on me and a reliance on me and a trust in me enough to say that you're going to follow my way. I want to bring you to a promised land, a place full of milk and honey. And he's telling the Israelites, I don't want you to be like these people that saw a miracle every single day, but they missed who God was. They missed that he is the bread of life that can take them to another way. And that's what I think God is saying to us when he says that we are the bread of life. I, you know, I think the question for me is this in John chapter 6. Why am I following Jesus? Am I following him because he gives me bread? Or am I following him because he is the bread of life? And look, that's a subtle change. And, and look, I'm going to say this. I'm not saying, hey, there's some real Christians in here and there's some that are... Not, it's not it at all. What I'm saying is, there's a better way. That's what I've been evaluating in my life. I would say this week, I didn't get the text that I was preaching until Friday. So since Friday, when I started to really dig into this passage, and read John chapter 6, it was one thing that, Lord, you know, I can't, I can't help apply it to anyone else if God doesn't first apply it to me. And I was reading this, and I was saying, Lord... Am I focused on my needs? Am I focused on, Lord, I need you to do this, 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 and this? Am I focused on your miracles and your blessings and your faithfulness so much? Am I focused on what you do that I never take time to start to realize who you are? And until I realize who you are, I can't realize who I am. And I can't live the plan that you have for my life. We talk about it all the time. Ephesians 3.20 he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, more than all that I could ask or imagine. But here's the thing. To get to that, 
but I love the exceedingly abundantly. I don't really understand all I could ask or imagine. So if I live my life like the people in John 6 or like the Israelites in the desert, where my head is down on my life, Lord, I need this. Lord, I need this. Lord, can you give me this? Can you give me this? And my head is always right here. I need this. Lord, give me strength for this. Give me strength for this. Give me strength for this. And I never understand. And even when I celebrate God's goodness, goodness in all of this, does that make sense? I think this is all God can do for me right here. He can, you know, he can pay my bills. He can make me maybe not lonely. He can give me, you know, he, he can make me feel a little better physically. This is all God can do. God was saying, no, you don't understand. When I healed you, when I provided for you financially, when, when, when I healed the brokenness in your heart, I'm glad you enjoyed that. I wanted to do that. But that was only a sign. That was only a sample for you to look up and say, wait a minute. He, if he can do this, could he do something that I couldn't even imagine? And so when we begin to say, You're the, you are the bread, I recognize that you are the bread of life. Now that means, Lord, I, I, I trust you more. In fact, I wrote down three things. What does it mean that we say that he's the bread of life, that he can actually give us more than we could ever imagine? The first one is this. I trust you to satisfy me and give me strength. Lord, I trust you to satisfy me. And here's where that gets difficult. When I have this need, I have this hunger. I say, Lord, I need some bread to fill this hunger. And you don't give it to me. If you're the bread of life, and you don't give me what I think I need, maybe I don't need it. Lord, maybe you know that I don't need it. Maybe you know that's developing something inside of me. When I recognize you are the bread of life, Lord, you satisfy all my needs. And if I have a need right now that's unmet, Lord, you've got a reason for it. And you sat at my relationship with you. My connection with you is enough. That satisfies me enough. I can go with an unmet need in this area. Because here's the thing I think we need to realize. On this side of heaven, we're always going to feel like we're missing something. Life's not going to be perfect. He's not going to arrange all the pieces. That's why we can't make our relationship with Jesus Christ be about all the pieces. Even in the Garden of Eden, when life was perfect, Adam and Eve were like, we need an apple. All right? I mean, it wasn't really an apple. It was a fruit. Blows me away. That's what they wanted. All right? But even in the Garden of Eden, they messed it up because they weren't satisfied with God and they felt like there was something missing. I think one of the saddest things I've ever seen in people's life is when they have a life that's mostly good, but there's this one part that man is just not there, and they leave all this to go follow that. Get that and realize they gave up all this. What did Jesus say? Pity the man that gains the whole world but loses his soul. And so when I say, Lord, I trust you to satisfy all my needs, what I'm saying is, Lord, you are enough. There's a song that we sing, Christ is the... I'm not going to sing it, all right? I started to, and I'm like, what are you doing? You know, it says, Christ is enough for me. And I, I don't know about you. I've sung that before and thought, ah, oh, is that true? And if it's not, God, make it true. I want you to be enough. So when we, when we recognize, Lord, you're the bread of life, that means, Lord, I trust you to meet all my needs and to give me strength. The second thing is this. I'll not be driven by my own hungers. Lord, I trust you. I will not be driven by my own hunger. I will not chase one craving after another. I will focus on you and I will pursue you, not all these things in my life that I think I'm missing because that will destroy my life facing those things. And the third thing is this. I will turn to you for satisfaction. And I'm going to ask the band to come out as we get prepared to close. I will turn to you for satisfaction. You know what my biggest conviction was this week as I was reading this verse and preparing this message and talking about the bread of life? And, you know, I, I kept, Lord, do I, do I believe that you're the bread of life? I, you know, I don't know if you ever ask. I think sometimes it's good to ask ourselves those questions that we think we take for granted. And I said, you know what? I do. Lord, I trust you. If there's something that's not right in my life, I trust that you're going to give me strength to get through it. That you're enough to cover those things. I'm not going to chase my hungers. But then here's my third question. If I believe you're the bread of life, then why do I pursue you more? Why do I not press in more? 
Because I don't know how you are. If I'm in my office like this last few weeks and somebody peeks in and they're like, hey, there's key cake in the break room, I'll leave a meeting. All right, I may ask, cream cheese icing, where did it come from? All right, but if it meets the criteria, there's not going to be king cake down there that I'm not a part of. All right, birthday cake, whatever it is, man, cooking for Christ, cook, hey, free on the line there. Why would I let something great be right next to me and I don't take part in it? And here's what I felt like God said to me, you do that every single day. If I believe that he is the bread of life, then why don't I push up to the table more often? Why, why do I go a week? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, we just finished a season of fasting. I mean, fasting is hard. Staying away from food is hard. But in a sense, if I'm not careful, I'm in a reverse fast way too often. There is a table over here with the bread of life that he said, he who believes in me will never hunger again. Hey, I'll get to that tomorrow. God's word, yeah, I, I can do that tomorrow. Hey, spend time in worship in my car. I, I'll do that this afternoon. Right now, I got, I got emails. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. If I truly believe that he is the bread of life, then I would push up to the table more often. Lord, I trust you. I believe in you. And if I believe you satisfy me, man, I want to get as close as I possibly can. Because you're the one. I, I spend too much time focusing on these things that are missing in my life. God, what's missing in my life is more of you. And everything else fails in, in comparison. I love that, that song. And I wasn't going to say this, so I hope I get the words right. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will become strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. See, when Jesus was saying, I am, the, I am the bread of life, he wasn't just saying, hey, you're believing wrong. He was saying, I'm right here. My glory and grace are right here. I want to pour things into your life that are greater than you could ever ask or imagine. But if you're focusing on that piece of bread that's not on your plate, You'll never be able to accept all the things that I have for you. Jesus wasn't feelings were hurt. He wasn't trying to beat them down for thinking the wrong way and believing the wrong way. And he, he wasn't, you know, getting on to them and frustrated at them. He just knew there was so much more available. And that's what I want. I want everything that's available. So I want to do this this morning. If you'll stand up. We, we talked about as a, as a team how to close this service. We felt like this would be a great time to take communion. So I'm going to ask you. I know it's last service and there's schedules and places that we need to be. But for the next few minutes, we're going to receive communion. In fact, when you walked in, you should have gotten one of these cups. If you didn't, would you raise your hand right now? And keep it up. We may have a few. I know we had... Uh, the place is, is packed so we have people come keep it up they will get to you but I, I want to ask everybody here if you'll just please kind of hang with me for a few more minutes we're actually a few minutes ahead of schedule we're going to do this we're going to receive communion and then we're going to close in a worship song I'd love for everyone to stay for that song's over as we press in and I want to read how Jesus closed this passage it's in verse 52 Verse 53, Jesus said this. Very truly I tell you, there's that phrase again. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That's a harsh saying. And look, they got mad at him for that, but not because it say it didn't sound as weird to them as it does to us. They understood what he was saying. But what he was saying is, you got to be all in to receive the blessing you got to be all in and that's the part that they didn't really like because look what he says whoever 
Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Why would I want anything else but I can have eternal life? And I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh it is real food. And my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. Isn't that what it's really all about? Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. So as we prepare to receive communion this morning, if you'll grab this cup. Pull out a top layer and grab that little wafer out. Let's do this. As we pray, <laughs> let's commit to God. Lord, I will recognize that you are the bread of life. You are the source of my satisfaction. You are the source of my strength. I'll not look anywhere else, and I will look to you more often. Father, Lord, we, we pray right now. God, we thank you for the strength that you give us. Lord, we thank you for the satisfaction in life that we receive from you that we can't receive from anything else. In fact, God, you make so much more of life worth living because we see you in it. So, Lord, we turn to you right now for strength. We turn to you right now for satisfaction. And we say, Lord, you are the bread of life. In your name we pray. Amen. To take the bread. second layer. You know, Jesus talks about that in John 6, but then about a year or so later, he gathers his disciples on the night before he was crucified. And they did what we're celebrating right now. They took bread and juice. They took bread and wine. And then he said this. He says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Maybe there's some here like me that as you read about the bread of life and that he believes will never hunger, you think, well, man, why am I not, why am I focused on other things and not focused on Jesus? Or maybe there's some here today that you've never accepted Jesus Christ into your heart. You've never asked him to forgive you of your sins. And the great thing is, everything that's available to us, we don't have to do anything for it except believe that he is who he said he is. In fact, in John 6, John said, I mean, Jesus says this. He says, your work is to believe in the one that the Father has sent. That's all we have to do is believe, really believe, recognize, maybe a better term, to understand, recognize, Lord, you're God. You died on the cross for my sins. I don't owe you anything for my sins. I mean, I do, but it's paid for. There's nothing I have to do to earn salvation, Lord, you've done it all. And I commit my life to you. I follow your way and not my way. And when we do that, not only does he forgive us of our sins, not only do we have access to a relationship with Jesus Christ, but he sends the Holy Spirit to live inside of us, to give us power to do the things that we could never do before. We say we commit our way to him. We can't do that in our own strength. He knows that. But the Holy Spirit helps us do that. What I'm hoping today, what I'm praying for today, is that there's at least one person here, and I hope there's many. That today is the day you cross from death into life. All right? From sin into salvation. And look, either way, we're the same. It's not that we're better. It's that we've accepted, finally received what Jesus did for us. And if that's you, and you say, I want the bread of life. I want that. I want a new covenant, a new start in Jesus' blood. As we pray and receive that, I want you to ask God, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your spirit to give me the power to obey you. And I commit my life to you. So we're going to pray, and I want you to pray that prayer as we do this. And then after we pray, we're going to sing a song. And please ask everyone stay. Uh, we'll close when that song's over. Father, Lord, we thank you for your blood. God, we thank you. God, that we were sinners on our way to hell and Lord left 
with an unfulfilled life. But you want so much more than that for us. So you died on the cross. You paid the price for our sin so that we could be forgiven, leave all our sin, our guilt, leave all our shame behind. Lord, live a new life with you, filled with the power of the Spirit so we can fulfill it. God, our eternity is with you, Lord. We know that heaven is now our home. Lord, I pray that somebody right now is praying that prayer. Lord, that you would fill them and let them know that you heard them right now. Lord, we thank you for your blood. And everything we enjoy in you goes back to this. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.